Unsiloed podcast is produced by University FM, elevating the stories of your institution. Uh, welcome to Unsiloed. This is Greg LeBlanc, and I'm here today with uh, Mark Kurlansky, who is, well, a very prolific author, uh, written in a lot of different domains. Um, I think probably most famously, you are the originator. I think you're an originator. I think you can take credit for the uh, genre, which is now all over the place, the single word title book, right? Starting with COD, which I think I read, oh gosh, um, I don't know, was it the the 90s that, that COD came out? I think that was the first one of your books that I that I read. The, si- the single word title, I, I might have some responsibility for it, though. I have to say that often I prefer more complicated titles and my publisher talks me into the <laughs> title because it's become sort of like a trademark yeah yeah well so in addition to sod a cod i think after that i read read salt um this is not the original copy because i think i bought it and it's buried somewhere um and there's a book about oysters which was fascinating uh there's the book um uh, about frozen food right bird's eye um you can i think detect a theme here then there's the, the book about the basques which i think was a natural outflow from the the cod book as well there's a book about gloucester right? The, the city, which is also sort of about the, the fishing industry. Uh, on the food theme, right, there are a couple more recent books, one on, on milk, uh, which I actually just read last week, a book on onions, which just came out, one right. of my favorite topics. <laughs> um, this one is about the food in the 30s, I guess, the WPA. WPA um, food, yeah. Yeah, and then it, um, it following... Inter- it was interesting because it... it it gives you a look at what food was like in America in the 1930s. And nowadays, you know, you talk about locavores and, you know, this is a time when everybody was a locavore and they wish they weren't, you know. Um, well, in, in all these food books, I mean, tough in the winter time, you know. Well, in all these food books, you, you spend a lot of time reading cookbooks. And um, yeah. I, I think cookbooks are sort of an underutilized historical resource. Right? I agree. I, I agree, especially um pre fanny farmer yeah uh, when when people used to really write recipes expressively and and recognize the fact that it's not a science and every chef is going to be a little different and um also a secret that most people don't know is that a good chef leaves something out right <laughs> well it's kind of like music right so if you go back and you look at the the written music from the Baroque period, right? a lot of people, when they first saw it, they thought, well, this is kind of boring. And that's because they, they left out all of the, the, the improvisation. Yeah. Yeah. And they, uh, I, I play cello and I have the manuscripts of box suites and uh, they're pretty tough to follow, but they're yeah. tough to follow anyway. Well, I, I do, I do a lot of cooking and um, you know, a lot of times people will come over and they'll say, oh, you got to give me the recipe for this. And I say, I don't have a recipe. <laughs> I, don't, I don't actually, if you weren't here watching, I don't really actually remember exactly what, what I did, certainly in terms of, you know, proportions. Sometimes, of- sometimes I'll ask a chef for a recipe and he'll sort of scratch his, his chin and say, well, let's see, you take a bunch of this and you take <laughs> of that. And that's what a recipe should be, you know? It's like, it's not science. Right. And it's up to you to decide how much butter or well, you know when you, you made a little bit of a detour into uh, you kept the single word i guess your publisher kept it but you went into this, this book right. on, on paper then there was now i don't think you were the originator but there's been a whole bunch of these you know books around a single year right like 1492 1491 and, and you came in with 1968 uh, right um and uh and then some other books on, on non-violence some other book is, this is kind of like a i mean i was gonna say it's a kid's book but it's not really a kid's book it's kind of little graphical but you've written kids books you know you well, it's, it's not a lot, a lot of my you know why book books for teenagers um work very well for adults also and i like to think of them as family books a book that you know you could read and your kids could read and you could talk about it right well i guess i wanted to ask you about method because it seems to me you know, I, I see you as, as a kind of a kindred spirit because it seems like when you want to learn about something, you decide, well, I'm gonna go write a book about it. And, you know, for me, if I want to learn about something, I, I go and, and te- teach a course about it. Um, and, and so, you know, how does, if, if you could go back and kind of look at the, the, the trajectory of how your curiosity manifests itself, 
how, how do you decide on on what constitutes a good topic for for a book? It's got to tell a good story. Um, I don't know any other way to do a book than to tell a story. Uh, maybe it has to do with the fact that I started off as a playwright. And, you know, the three-act play, the beginning, the middle, and the end, um, there's got to be a story there. I struggled with salt. Mm -hmm. uh, after my COD book, in my COD book, I realized the importance of salt. Because you couldn't have a fishery if you didn't have salt. And my publisher was very interested in me doing something on salt and really pushed me to it. And I kept saying, well, but where's the story? Mm -hmm. And then I realized that the story uh is that here was this ingredient commodity mineral uh that was of tremendous value that uh nations would go through i mean they founded colonies and they went to war and went to all these lengths to uh to get the salt and then salt lost its value yeah so what was it for and um i believe that that is the trajectory of oil <laughs> mm. it got there. But interestingly, and to my great surprise, I discovered that while he was president, George W. Bush read my salt book. <laughs> yeah. And he was a book reader. I think he did read a lot of well, books. Well, yes, I, I kind of felt bad about this because, you know, there I am driving on the Massachusetts Turnpike and uh, some White House correspondent calls me and I... I have this habit of getting, because I used to be a foreign correspondent and I get very friendly with foreign co correspondents and I forget what they're doing, you know? And so I just very flippantly said, really, he reads books? Yeah. And that went everywhere, that went everywhere. And it sounded kind of unfair because in fact, it turns out he does read books. Mm -hmm. uh, and his wife is a librarian. Uh, and maybe, if I hadn't been so flippant, uh, I could have talked to him about it because I wonder what he got out of it because he has an oil background. Yeah. Well, you know, I was interested in salt because I used to study French history and uh, the French kings, right. of course, had the salt tax, the, the gabelle, which was, you know, pretty major source of, of revenue. And I remember when I learned about that, I a thought- major, A major source of political unrest too. Yeah, and I thought, well, how, you know, what the heck, right? Um, but the kind of the demand elasticity for salt is, is you know, it's very high, right? If you don't have salt, you die. And, you know uh, that the New York Public Library, one of the world's great institutions, has an original copy of the Assemblée Nationale's edict uh, canceling the gabelle. Yeah. Well, I mean, it makes me wonder, you mentioned book reading. Look, you've probably written more books than the average American has has read. In, in, in their lifetime. Well, that's um, disturbing, but it may be true. <laughs> right? And, and uh, you know, uh, obviously there, we've seen a transition uh, away from physical books to electronic books, but we've also seen a move away from books in, in, in general. And yeah, I, I, I would have to say, because I looked into this when I did my paper book and, you know, electronic books are not taking over. Um, at first they grew a lot, you know, because if you only sell one and the next year you sell two, that's a hundred percent increase, you know, mm -hmm. so there's these great numbers about the increase, but it only increased up to a point. And regular books actually are standing up quite well to uh, um, uh, eBooks. People are uh, deciding that eBooks are good for certain things, but not for other things. Good for research. Well, it's, it's so books. But there's probably a bigger gap between sales and consumption now because books are, are a lot cheaper. I mean, in the old days, if you bought a book, I mean, it was, you only bought it if, if, if you were going to, I mean, obviously there's the Gatsby phenomenon with the fake books and so forth. But I mean, if you, if you bought a book, I mean, you, 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 this was, you know, you read about these people. I, I was just reading an essay by someone uh, who, uh, you know, fled Gaza and he, he was, you know, very upset that he had to leave his, you know, 20 books behind. And so, you know, we may see lots of physical books being sold, but, you know, are they, are they being read, I guess? I, did, did um, you I, I, I lived in France for a long time in Paris for about 10 years. And when I went to homes of affluent people, 
I would because when I go to somebody's place, I always check out their what they have in their bookshelves. <laughs> yeah, they too. Apple in people's homes, and they'd have all these great leather bound classics. And they were all in mint. Yeah, the, 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 the Garnier, right? The Flammarion yeah. Garnier yeah. books, right? With the with the gold print on the on the leather binders and stuff. Right. And they, and, and they all looked in mint condition, condition. And I thought, well, these people aren't reading at all. They're just decorating their room. Yeah. So then I when I, I see a natural trajectory. So, you know, cod led led to salt, which which led to, to the Basques. Um, and so is is this trajectory driven by you, your curiosity? Is it driven by kind of a dialogue with with your with your publishers? Do you do you think about what people are going to want to read, or is it primarily about what you're interested in, in learning about? Uh, I'm egotistical enough to believe that what I'm interested in will interest other people. <laughs> or I can make them interested in it. Right. Uh, I, I don't spend any time really thinking about what people are interested in. I, I spend a lot of time thinking about what's interesting and why is it interesting, and then I can make it interesting for them, mm -hmm. uh, which is what a really good publisher does. Not, it's, it's kind of rare. Publishers spend lots of time worrying about what they think is selling and what's you know marketable, but a really smart publisher um like the guy who published cod will will say okay this is something interesting how do we get people to get interested in it um, well i mean in, within history departments i don't think food was a major concern until fa fairly recently um and i think i mean i i was just yeah that was it. that was kind of at one point a mission of mine um mm -hmm. Because it used to be that, you know, food history was not an American thing. And I lived in Europe and it was a French thing and it was an Italian thing and it was a Spanish thing, and definitely a Basque thing. And, um, and I thought it should be an American thing too. And then I also had the good fortune to be writing for the same paper as Waverly Root. Mm -hmm. Do you remember Waverly Root, the yeah. food writer? We both wrote for the International Herald Tribune at the same. Uh -huh. And he wrote wonderful food columns. And uh, I thought, yeah, you know, you know, you can make this stuff accessible, you can make it fun, you can make it full of good stories, and there's not nearly enough of it. Now there is really enough of it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I remember when I when I read Fernand Braudel the first time, right, in, in college, and he seemed to emphasize the importance of everyday life and, the, and the, the, the the material elements of, of everyday life. And and so I think within well, the but, academy, he might have been the one responsible for, for bringing it. But I remember Jacques Pepin in his, I remember his memoir, he described how when he came to America, he wanted to study food and he went up to Columbia and said, hey, I want to study food. And they, they looked at him like he was, a, he was a nut, right? But then he was later in life able to help establish a, a, some center for the study of food at, at, at Columbia. Right. Yeah. Um, that's actually come a long way in America. I mean, it, it, uh, what am I going back to, you know, even like the 1980s, there wasn't much in America about food. Mm -hmm. and you mentioned Baudel. Baudel's whole idea of history is that you have to look at all aspects of life to tell the story of history and food is, uh, you know, food is one of them. I, I, when I read history, I often find myself asking, but what are they eating? Yeah, right. I do that with fiction too. And, you know, certain writers like Tolstoy tell you, James Joyce tells you, um, I, I'm a great believer in food fiction. I just signed a contract for a book, another one word title, a novel called Cheesecake. <laughs> this is a novel that takes place entirely on my block in New York. It takes place on 86th Street between Amsterdam and Columbus Avenue. And it's about a, uh, a cheesecake uh, trend, which starts because a, a little Greek diner decides to go upscale and, and, and make Cato's Cheesecake. And about 200 BC, the 
Roman Senator Cato wrote a recipe for cheesecake, which was, you know, the, the, the oldest written recipe. And it was written in Latin, one of the first things written in Latin, because they used to write in Greek. And it's completely incomprehensible. So all these people in the neighborhood are trying to do it, but they don't understand that they're all coming out with completely different things. And who has it right and who has the best cheesecake? That's that's my new novel. <laughs> well, and that would be unusual, right? Because in the milk book, you talk about how uh, dairy was not a big thing among right. the, the Romans, right? I mean, they, they, well, they looked at- cheese, but cheese was. Yeah, so like a feta type of cheese, I guess would be right. popular, but the book, uh, milk is not just about milk, of course, it's about cheese, <laughs> it's about yogurt, uh, and it's it's not just about animal dairy. I mean, you talk about human uh, breastfeeding. And and I guess for, for Europeans, um, they're continuously reminded of their provinciality when they realize that milk and dairy products are, are kind of a U European thing. I mean, they're a European slash Arab thing, maybe Indian thing, right? But there's, there's a, it's not universal uh, around the world, this love of, of dairy products. And I just spent a week with- uh, well, some, some... well, you know, uh, Asia used to have almost no dairy, but now they're starting to, you know, it's, a, it's starting to westernize. So they're having, you know, Japan has dairy now and China has dairy. And they used to believe that they were lactose intolerant, but actually it turns out they're not. Hmm. For most art. But lactose intolerance is a really interesting thing because right. actually we're supposed to be lactose intolerant. That's the way we're made. We're, hmm. we're made so that we get milk for nourishment till we're about two years old. And then this enzyme comes in that makes us no longer tolerate milk because we're not supposed to be breastfeeding anymore. And that's supposed to be the end of it. And somehow this mutant thing came about where the enzyme didn't step in and people kept having milk, not breastfeeding, but, you know, started substituting with animal milk, which must have been a really weird idea when somebody first thought of it. Mm -hmm. You know, forget mom, how about that goat over there? <laughs> <You know? Right. laughs> um, and um, so originally, most people were lactose. Originally, everybody was lactose intolerant, then everybody but a few people. And now... Um, it's getting, I think the majority of people are still lactose intolerant, but it's getting to be about 50-50. And it's going in a trend where it's going to be more and more, more and more people can have uh, milk. Yeah, I mean, it'd be interesting to see if, 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 the evolu if you know, ev we can watch evolution in, in real time. But, but you also allude to maybe this idea that we will have cosmetic manipulation of our tolerances. You know, we can... If we want our children to consume milk, we can maybe go in there and s snip a few things and say, hey, you know, look at the joy that I'll create for my kids if I can yeah, figure okay. out a way to. Yeah. But then what other things are we going to manipulate? This gets really scary. Right. Well, look, I'm, I'm, I'm Irish. I'm like 100% Irish, so I, I can eat dairy all day and, and, and all night. Um, but, it, you know, it's becoming... See, that, is a, that, that is a genetic thing by certain cultures just lost that uh, lactose intolerance. Uh, Irish are a good example. Very rare to have a lactose intolerant Irishman. It would be like an Irish teetotaler, for God's sakes. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, I, I, I can, I can, uh, I, I, I can also drink plenty of uh, alcohol. What I haven't done is I, I haven't really gained an appreciation for for mixing the two. Although you, you offer up some some insights on, on that trend, right? With, when, um, I was a, when, I, when I was a newspaper journalist, I used to work with this Irish guy who had severe ulcers. And so he wasn't supposed to drink. And so he used to drink whiskey and milk. Mm -hmm. I mean, the milk made it all right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. And, and once we were we were covering a Mexican election, and in Mexico, a lot of Latin American elections, they closed the bars on election days. But if, if you know somebody in the ruling party, you can get a drink. So we knew somebody in the ruling party, and we went to the their bar. And the guy walks up to the bar and says, can I have a whiskey with milk? And he says, you can't have milk? He says, why? Because it's election day? <laughs> <laughs> Well, have you have you thought of writing a book on uh, on beer? Say, I mean that beer is one of our oldest uh, food substances. Yeah, I I don't know. I haven't. Uh, I I think it's been done. Yeah, 
Um, although, you know, you could write a whole book just on stout. <laughs> <laughs> right. You know, a particular type of, of, of beer. But you also talk about kind of human milk consumption and how that has been a contentious thing over time. And we've seen in our own lifetime. Keep going through cycles. And yeah. I mean, I was of that generation, which was, um, you know, bottle fed, right? And, and it was, and it, it was strange because I, th I think a lot of that was, was political or, or technological. There was a lot of advertising and, and I think this ties in with the, the processed food thing. So I think my, my mom thought that to be modern was to, you know, buy frozen food and packaged food. And so she didn't cook. And I grew up in a household where, oh, she cooked, but she'd, you know, make tuna helper and stuff. And, and I think that that was seen as the, the height of sophistication, right? Like you don't have to actually cook, right? You're part of the modern world. And, and I remember reading these, my very first cookbook, uh, which, which I got and I was reading through the recipe and I realized that every single, you know, recipe had Campbell soup in it. And I was like, this is really weird. And then I realized that the book was actually published by the Campbell's company. Right. right. And when you, when you looked in all those red books and, and home and garden, all those magazines and they had recipes, I, I didn't realize that, but they were all like sponsored recipes. It was like soap yeah. operas, you know? And, and so they were pushing great you know, books, fried onions, <laughs> Remember Durkee's fried onions? They would be pushing this stuff in, in the- Great in the, books in the published by the Jell-O company. Yeah. Right? Whole books on what to do with Jell-O. <laughs> yeah. And, and I think part of that movement was to convince moms that they should be, you know, buying formula for, for their kids if they really wanted to be modern because science had come somehow, you know, surpassed nature and, and uh, right. know, figured out a way to do it better than nature without the- Formula. Hassle formula was better than they could devise a formula that was better milk than than, than mother's milk uh-huh and you know we we now limit i mean just like we limit our meat to chicken and, and beef for the most part we seem to limit our our milk consumption to cow milk i mean here in berkeley of course you can get goat milk and sheep milk and so forth but in berkeley they probably limit their consumption to goat milk <laughs> well, you can actually, you mentioned human milk. I mean, there are these places where you can buy human yeah. milk and, and uh, you mentioned that some adults actually will consume human milk. That seems a little, a, a little bizarre, but. Well, it's flipped it, around because they're thinking of it as a really natural thing to do, but it's actually a really unnatural thing to do. Right. And you mentioned, I guess, some um, professor at Oxford <laughs> that survived on, 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 human breast milk for a couple of years oh yeah yeah um and you know there were all these beliefs that the, the kind of milk you consumed determined your character mm -hmm. so if you had a lot of goat milk you'd be sure-footed mm -hmm. <laughs> i tried that it didn't work <laughs> oh um, yeah you know all these things uh uh they used to I mean, there was a time when women, upper class women didn't want to breastfeed, but they believed in breastfeeding. So they hired milkmaids, nursemaids to do yeah, nursemaids to uh, breastfeed their children. And then it was believed that the children's character would be affected by the character of the, the woman who was nursing them. So they were very careful to select you know, if you had somebody who was bad tempered and breastfed your kid, you'd have mm. a bad tempered kid. Uh, and then there was this whole thing about uh, do you want your kid to be breastfed by blondes or brunettes? Not redheads. Don't have your child breastfed by a redhead. I mean, there's all this stuff people were very serious about. Well, that didn't stop them from hiring slaves, right? As uh, interestingly yes isn't that interesting uh these people who at the same time you know thought that the the, the the person who nurses your child affects the character of it at the same time believed that black people were were mm -hmm. worthless but had black people breastfeed their kids it's, it's kind of it's a bit of a mystery why that industry doesn't exist anymore um because parents now outsource but, everything else right I mean, so why I don't they 
I think breastfeeding or slavery. No, no, I mean, right. Uh, right. The, the idea of a nursemaid, right? Is this, why, why is this industry completely disappeared? It, it, it seems, seems like um, a great solution to uh, a problem of, of, is it just because formula is so easily available that the labor costs yeah. would be too high? And, and I think these were, uh, these were uh, a certain class of women who didn't have any other possibility. And uh, uh, it really was kind of a product of a social injustice. Everything's a product of social injustice if you dig deep enough, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and you mentioned also that um, donkey milk was considered the best milk. Now, even here in Berkeley, I can't find donkey milk anywhere. Have, have you have you tried this? Have I tried donkey milk? You know, I don't think I have. When I was doing the milk book, I tried every kind of milk I could get my hands on and tried some pretty strange milks, but I don't think I ever had donkey milk. Mm -hmm. If you had donkey milk, you would be very sweet natured and sure footed. Right. People don't have enough donkey milk. Uh -huh. <laughs> Well, I, I think one of the trends also is this um, move towards mass production and uh, the relentless pressure of lowering costs. But yes, I mean, this is what's happening with, with, with breastfeeding also. Um, it, it, it all started with Obamacare uh, covering breast pumps. Mm -hmm. And with most women with a good breast pump can produce more milk than their child needs. Mm -hmm. So then you have milk to, to sell. Well, one uh, thing you didn't, you didn't mention, but I've, I've learned in other contexts is that the, when it comes to milk, the morning milk and night milk are, are very different. If you drink night milk in the morning, it puts you to sleep. Um, and, and so you really need to timestamp your, your milk. Now, I don't know if that's true for, Cow milk, right? <laughs> you know, we're, well, we're well, no, because dairies wouldn't separate them, right? Yeah, they'd blend them. The milk you die, you buy, would not be. It's not for one milking, right? Yeah, but for humans, it, it it is coming from a specific. But the reason why I mentioned this this pressure to economize is that we've seen this homogenization of of wheat and of rice and all sorts of other things, but we've seen it in milk as well. So almost all cow milk that we buy comes from these Holsteins. And, and I, I've, I, I really like this Jersey cow milk, um, but it's getting increasingly difficult to, yes. to find, right? Yeah, yeah. richer, yeah. richer milk. Yeah, they, and there's, a, there's a dairy here in the Bay Area that just went bankrupt and they couldn't, and I couldn't understand why they went bankrupt because there are people that would just pay anything, right? Seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve dollars for a, a container of milk, but they just simply couldn't, couldn't make it work economically. And they were using jerseys. Yeah. Yeah, because they weren't productive enough. Right. That's why they use Holsteins, because Holsteins really crank it out. Um, but uh, I don't know if you've noticed this, but if you go back to old recipes, even like 19th century recipes, sometimes you'll have a recipe that calls for milk. And you will get a better result if you substitute light cream mm. because milk used to be richer. Mm -hmm. And the milk they're talking about isn't the milk that we get. Right. My, my grandfather was from Ireland and, and he used to take my, my mom up to upstate. They were in New York City, of course, and he would take them up periodically to, to the farms so that he could get access to uh, genuine buttermilk, which I, I was very popular in, in Ireland, but almost impossible to find in the US. And I, I don't think I've actually ever had real buttermilk. <laughs> I think the buttermilk you buy in the store is, is not actually buttermilk. It's sort of a milk that's been sort of altered with some, some kind of uh, acid, really? right? I don't know. I don't know. I grew up with buttermilk, but I don't know uh, anything about what it was. Mm -hmm. or why I grew up with it. My parents liked buttermilk. They definitely weren't Irish, but it was Jewish buttermilk. <laughs> yeah. Well, well there's, a, there's another sort of uh, theme in, in the book, which has to do with um, kind of infection and, and illness and uh, these um, 
the quality of the milk. And during the 19th century, 20th century, the, the quality got really, really bad. And this led to laws around pasteurization. And I think to this day, people tend to be very suspicious of, of raw milk products. And I've had some cheeses confiscated. <laughs> I'm bringing it back. Have from, you really? From Europe. Oh yeah. The dogs, the, the dogs come by and, and, and I got in trouble and then uh, my global entry was denied because I had to have some cheeses and some, some meats. No, uh, I always bring in raw milk cheeses and I've never been questioned on it. Well, maybe they don't have the dogs in, in New York city airport or the dogs up there are looking for drugs, but the dogs, in, drug sniffing dog. we don't have cheese sniffing dog, dogs in New York. <laughs> we have in California, we have the, the, the fruit sniffers and the cheese sniffers and the meat sniffers and they're, Oh, they're, that's you know. right. Because California is obsessed with bringing in dairy products. Yeah. So, uh, so I've had we it confiscated had a great mystery when I was a child, mm -hmm. you get to California and Say, do you have any fruit in your car? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Who wants to know? <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. And um, uh, another trend is, is another theme is about sort of the authenticity of things like like cheeses. And so the the kind of AOC, DOC um, thing where if you Europeans get extremely upset when we sell Wisconsin cheese called Parmesan. <laughs> and uh, well, as they should. Like or California wine called Bordeaux. Right. Or Burgundy. <laughs> yeah. Gallo Hardy Burgundy. Right. Right. Which, you know, I mean, Burgundy, real Burgundy is just the greatest wine in the world. <laughs> and people who think Gallo is 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 Burgundy just have no idea. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, well, and, and you also, you also want Europeans to... have that labeling for a reason. I mean, they're protecting things that are really good. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, Wisconsin Parmesan is not Parmesan. <laughs> right. I was I was astonished to to learn that Parmesan was a big deal even in the late Middle Ages. Oh yeah, people, absolutely. yeah. It was a huge export. Yes, yes. Well, of course, you know, one of the whole ideas behind behind making cheese was that it was a dairy product that you could export. Mm -hmm. It's salt again. Yeah. Only with salt. And you, you have to think about before the Industrial Revolution, if you wanted to have an international economy, what did you trade? Mostly food. And you couldn't trade food unless it was salted. So basically, if you didn't have salt, you didn't have an international economy. Mm -hmm. And as far as dairy farmers go, your possibility for trade was to make cheese. Well, isn't is, it interesting that all these things that we eat like whatever, prosciutto or, or, or Parmesan or even beer and wine, these things were invented for preservation reasons. And and so that, that reason's gone, and yet we still consume all this stuff, right? Yeah, and, and you know, I mean, Basques still make exquisite dishes out of salted cod. Mm -hmm. No reason for it all anymore, except that people like it. And, you know, so they try to make cod that's not so salted. And it's not nearly as good. And that's what's happened with a lot of things. I mean, bacon is not nearly as salt as, as it used to be before refrigeration. Mm -hmm. All these products like bacon and ham, and, um, you know, salted fish, uh, anchovies and things. Uh, there's no reason for them anymore, except that we, we like them. Yeah. And so, you know, there's a tendency to just sort of do a token salt because the salt isn't necessary. You're putting it in the refrigerator anyway. But in a lot of cases, they're better if you really salt them. Yeah. Well, what's remarkable to me is how you can walk into a grocery store in, in California and you can get Roquefort and you can get Parmesan and you can get from, you know, anywhere in the world, the, these things, which- Oh, of course, you really, you, you, you just named two of the smartest cheese makers. Yeah. And Parmesan are two examples of, of old time traditional cheesemakers who really figured out how to make it an international product. Mm -hmm. But when you go to Europe, it's, it's, it's not quite like that, right? You walk into a, I just came back from, from Spain and you walk into a Spanish uh, store like Corte Inglés and they might have a thousand f Spanish wines and maybe one token Italian wine and one, one token French wine. Right? And you get, you come to America and you get a better selection of Italian wines than you get in Spain. And a better... <laughs> It's going for your market. 
you know? I mean, French people don't want to drink foreign wines. They want to drink French wines and Spanish want to drink Spanish wines. And and for that matter, you know, a Catalan doesn't want to drink Basque wine. (laughs) Right. uh, You know, uh, somebody from uh, uh, Tuscany doesn't want to drink a wine from uh, uh, the north. And uh, um, an interesting thing I noticed in France is that so many of the people in Paris um, have roots in other parts of France. And they generally drink the wine from the region that their family came from, even though, you know, they may have left three generations ago. Mm. So Europeans kind of have loyalty to these these products. And uh, uh, you're not going to do very well with uh, Italian wine in France or... Uh, Although, you know, you can do okay selling California wine in France because it's a thing. Yeah, but still very, very small thing. Yeah, but it's kind of a hip thing to have a California wine. Uh And I remember once I was, uh, I used to write about wine for the International Herald Tribune. I used to write about wine in Germany where they have these incredible wines. People don't know. They're very expensive. And the German wines you usually find around are cheap ones that, Right. but really good german wines are incredible um but they tend to be white rieslings and riesling but you know i mean great riesling mm. not not like leapfrau milch not not leap <laughs> right. Right. right that was the stuff that I, they had when i was growing up as a kid that was that was the german wine that everybody right. Right. Well, what happened was after the war, when Germany was sort of rebuilding the industry, these people came up with these Rieslings that they actually added sugar to. Yeah. Um, but they still make the old stuff the right way. And it's very expensive and it's incredible. And I, I was having dinner at a castle that was owned by this old winemaker. And he was having this great meal and, you know, his wines with the meal. But the main course was some sort of a heavy beef thing. And he served a California wine. Mm. It wasn't a German wine that, or certainly not one of his wines that went with the uh, beef. Yeah. I mean, I think food history kind of maps other types of history in the sense that, you know, the French are very protective of their language and they don't like neologisms and, you know, they try to preserve it. And the same with, same with food. And I think one of the things we all love about, you know, going to Europe is the sense of place and the sense of uh, history. But there's also this something wonderful about how in, in America, you know, we can we can mix and match, right? So one of the things you talk about is how in Italy, God forbid, you should put, you know, cheese with your your fish or you know, you should, no, no. Oh, mix onions and garlic. Oh my God, don't do that. <laughs> or, you know, uh, uh, have a cappuccino afternoon and and uh, and, and uh, you know, I I just I, I feel perfectly free to violate all of those those rules. I didn't because, know that you're not supposed to have a cappuccino in the afternoon. Oh yeah, no. If you have cappuccino in the afternoon, you're you're a barbarian. In, in Did Italy. you know that according to the Catalan rules, you should not have paella in the evening? <laughs> right. right. So, I, I don't have any problem ignoring those those rules as as an American. Um, and so, I mean, it does does seem like there's there's some kind of uh, trade off? Uh, and we in America are comfortable with like pigeon cuisine, where like our language, we just kind of beg, borrow, and, and steal from oh, wherever. It, 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 it's who we are. Yeah. That's why this whole fight about immigrants is so stupid, because we're all immigrants, and it's what this country is all about. Mm-hmm. And uh, we should celebrate that more. What we do in our food. Well, you, you've written about things other than food, of course, uh, and, you know, very, very serious historical books. Um, this book on nonviolence, for instance. Um, I think I'm it, passionate yeah, and maybe you could you could talk a bit about the origins of, of of that book and and how you decided to tackle that subject. Well, uh, got to go back a little to who I am. <laughs> I have always been a nonviolent anti-war person. When I was a kid, growing up in the fifties, I was thrilled by the ban the bomb movement. Uh, which, you know, the, the, the peace symbol was originally the symbol for the Ban the Bomb movement. Mm. And um, I was a vet- Vietnam War resistor. I was drafted and refused to go. So I, I, have, I have a whole 
history there. And Modern Library had this series and they said to me, uh, do you have some subject you're passionate about that you want to write a little book on? And I just immediately said nonviolence. And I got the Dalai Lama to write the intro, which was nice. And I tell you an interesting thing about this book. It's of my 40 books. It is the only one that has ever made people angry, where I've gone to readings and there's actually been people mm. shouting at me angrily. Um, it's amazing how many people <clears throat> get angry with you if you oppose war. Mm. Um, and the Quakers have asked me to do a number of things. And I finally once said to this Quaker guy who's organizing this thing, I said, you know, you guys have been saying this stuff for centuries. What do you need me for? He said something interesting. He said, well, the interesting thing about you is that you don't make a moral argument. You make a pragmatic argument. You say it doesn't work. Hmm. And, and that is my argument. There are no military solutions, not in the Middle East, not anywhere. It just doesn't work. Um, and uh, that's a hard idea to sell because okay. governments... You know, that's a tool they have in their pocket that they don't want you to take away from them. Well, I mean, bring yeah, a military solution, what are you going to come up with to do? Mm -hmm. you got to be but, a little creative or original. Bring the strands together, uh, there's some interesting studies that show that when um, people eat together, their negotiations turn out to be much more, more fruitful, right? And it's... Uh, yes. And so, you know, it, when, when we when we broker peace agreements, we, we ought to be doing it over food and over, over, uh, over, we, over we wine. Should, we should be eating right now. Yeah. I read this book about the, um, origins of the, um, uh, I guess the, the peace in South Africa. And, uh, apparently the, there were members of the ANC and members of the security services that were meeting secretly, um, for, for meals. And, and drinks right? and, and and that was a big part of it they would they would sit together and, and drink and eat and then start talking about their families and it was that which sort of triggered or the the process which ultimately yeah. led to reconciliation oh i mean something happens when you sit down and eat i've done uh interviewed wbur is uh, public radio boston uh in some of my food books one of them i don't remember which one they actually brought in they had somebody cook some of the dishes in the book and they brought them in and w they had several people there interviewing me and we we're eating all these dishes while they're interviewing me one of the best interviews i've ever done yeah well too bad we can't we can't we can't do that right here well, well i didn't we do it out yet how to zoom a meal <laughs> yeah well i had i had an interview just a couple weeks ago where my guest was was drinking gin and tonics <laughs> during the interview oh that worked, that worked. <laughs> and i was like wow i felt like where's mine <laughs> I, to... I, I did a uh, i wrote a novel some years ago called uh boogaloo on second avenue about the lower east side and there's a scene in it, it's about gentrification, and there's a scene in it where these new people have moved in and they're drinking pink martinis. And in the back of my book, as is often my habit, I give a bunch of recipes, including a recipe for pink martinis. And I did a reading of the book, actually, in, in Canada, in uh, Vancouver, at a uh, bookstore that had a kitchen, and they served things. When you did readings and what they served for my reading was pink martinis and you know if you're giving a talk and everybody's drinking pink martinis you can <laughs> miss you know <laughs> I, I, you know and, and i teach evening classes here at uh, berkeley and um during the break people go and eat and uh now we've started serving alcohol at the uh, cafeteria and uh, so I would come out during the break I'd see people drinking beer and at first I thought well this is terrible this is not going to turn out well um, but it's actually been fine. Right? It's a little more participate, a little more participation, maybe than uh, I, I would have gotten um, otherwise. Let me tell you about another nonviolent book that hasn't come out yet, but I'm, it's in the editing process now. Um, it's about 
a group of abolitionists in Boston, the first half of the 19th century. Uh, nonfiction. Nonfiction. Uh, who believed absolutely in nonviolence and believed that the only way to end slavery, to emancipate slaves, was without violence, because if you use violence to emancipate them, it would, they said it would take 100 years for Black people to get their rights. Turns out to be worse than that. But the, the point is that violence doesn't persuade people. You have to persuade them. Um, and these people, these nonviolent activists, which included Frederick Douglass and William Lloyd Garrison, and some people who are remembered and some incredible people who are not remembered, and what were they doing? They were doing uh, they were doing boycotts and they were doing freedom rides on Boston commuter rails and they were they, they sang freedom songs and, and they were um, they were laying out the entire program of the 20th century civil rights movement. Mm -hmm. And uh, Thoreau was in this group also. And one thing I noticed is uh, I, I thought of this because you were mentioning Berkeley. So, you know, uh, Mario Savia's famous speech that supposedly started the 60s student movement when he stood on the hood of a car and he gave this speech about how you have to stop the machine. Mm -hmm. That's Thoreau. That comes right from Thoreau's civil disobedience. Uh, these people were incredibly influential, but nobody remembers them. Mm -hmm. Well, why why do you suppose this idea of nonviolence is so uh unpopular i mean I, I can see people being because i skeptical you know, of it but why would why would it inspire I had, I had vitriol a, i had a great conversation once with eo wilson the biologist uh who was a pacifist and he was an expert on ants uh which are very violent animals he said if ants had nuclear weapons the world would last two minutes yeah and he, it was his contention that we are hardwired, these were his words, hardwired for violence. It's in our nature. Um, and this is what he called the natural fallacy, because we don't have to do everything that's in our nature. It's in our nature to eat with our hands and to run naked. <laughs> you know, we do lots of things in our nature. Uh, so, you know, the idea that we have to be violent because we're hardwired for it is, is, is nonsense. But it answers your question, why people so resistant. Mm -hmm. People feel that you are taking away, well, their weapon. <laughs> this is their weapon. You're taking it away. Um, and, you know, society is so built on perpetuating war that, you know, all soldiers are heroes, that wars are... Um, I was just, I was just uh, uh, surfing through Netflix last night, and they actually had a program on called called "The Great Moments of World War II." Mm -hmm. Were they really great moments? Um, people don't want that taken away from them, except combat veterans. Combat veterans hate the whole thing. Yeah, and when I when this book came out and I was giving talks about it at the talks, the combat veterans were the people on my side. Hmm. Well, you, you wrote this book on 1968 and um, I know this was a personal project in many ways. Do, do you think, I mean, do, that's receding more and more into our memory. And I think when people were closer to that time, that the significance of that year was, uh, was more pronounced. Um, yeah. I mean, it's, would, yeah, go ahead. How would you evaluate the the kind of the hopes and dreams of the 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 people were um, had during during that period? Now, I mean, what's the what's the legacy of of nineteen sixty eight? Well, you know, I mean, first of all, you have to understand that the really remarkable thing about nineteen sixty eight is that it happened. It happened all over the world in very similar ways. With, it was like 1848, right? And, you know, there's certain yeah, years. Where but the 1848 was just Europe. Yeah. And it happened all over the world with no internet, with no, you know, 
1968, it was a huge deal. I went to college in Indiana and I'm from New England. And, you know, if I called home, which I almost never did, they'd immediately say, oh, get off the phone. This is long distance. You know? and that was true. That was true for me in the 80s, too. Right? It was, when I lived yeah. in France, it was uh, I wrote letters. Right. In 1989, I was writing letters. Right. And, you know, so you didn't have, I mean, communication was, I mean, there they were at Columbia and in Paris doing the exact same thing at the exact same time and not really even being that aware of each other. I mean, I, I talked to people in Danny uh, Cohn Bendit and, uh, or is it Bendit Cohn, I forget, in Paris and, uh, you know, he was amazed when he heard what was going on in in uh, Colombia, and uh, but it all it all just sort of happened um, without being planned, without anybody launching an international program. So, why did it happen? It happened <laughs> yeah, because of people like me, who, you know, grew up. Um, covering their head under the desk and learning about the ban the bomb movement, <laughs> you know, um, the post-World War II generation, you know, I knew many people, including family members who were doing so well from their experiences as veterans, you know, when everybody's talking about the great veterans and their great experiences. But from what I saw in my family and the families of people I went to school with, they, they didn't have a great experience. And, you know, this is how we grew up. I grew up convinced that when I was about 19 years old, there would be a war waiting for me. And damn if there wasn't. And I saw it coming, you know, it's, it's, it's Johnson's talk about the, 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 the attack in the Gulf of Tonkin. I'm sitting there in front of the TV saying, there it is. Um, so it's, it, it was the peculiar place in history of people of, uh, of our generation, um, uh, in the Soviet Union and, and in the, you know, the Eastern Europe, uh, this is the post-World War II generation that, that wanted to see communism become what it was supposed to be and, and, uh, be open to change and reform. And uh, they loved that idea in Czechoslovakia. And, and so uh, Rezhnev invaded. <laughs> and, um, you know, so it was really history coming to an edge at this, this certain point for, for my generation. But I was thinking, uh, because we talk now about how this country is divided. And I mean, man, it really is. But in, in the 60s, we used to talk about that a lot, how it was divided. But it was divided in a different way. I mean, if you think about it, if you think about somebody like Nixon, uh, Nixon had far more supporters than Trump will ever have uh, because there were independent voters and reasonable people who, who thought that Nixon at least wasn't crazy. <laughs> and, uh, now, you know, and then there were divides. There was certainly a huge divide on the Vietnam War, and and uh, people don't realize. I mean, more people opposed the Iraq War than opposed the Vietnam War. Uh, did we ever get to fifty percent? I don't know. Um, but what we have, what, what we had then, was you know, a split between two ways of thinking, and it was often said to be generational, although it wasn't always true. You had Dave Dellinger in the anti-war movement, who was my parents' generation, and uh, th that whole thing was exaggerated, but I trusted people who were over 30. Um, but there was a kind of a generational thing. Um, I mean, the World War II generation, we were different from the World War II generation. It was clear when I discussed the Vietnam War with my veteran father, you know, who really didn't want me to go to war, but he didn't want me to oppose war. To publicly oppose war was kind of an embarrassment. Um, you know, so there it was a, a generational thing that was going on. Now, um, 
what is it? I guess it's kind of a class thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my, my father was uh, in World War II, and I mean, he didn't fight, but he was uh, in the Navy. And I remember during the first Iraq War, I, I decided to play a joke on him, and, and I told him that I enlisted, and uh, and and he he went berserk. <laughs> he said. You, you know, he, he was like, you did what? Like, you, <laughs> he was extremely upset. And I had to, you know, admit that I, I had actually, I was lying and I had not uh, actually enlisted. <laughs> but, um, you know, and he was as patriotic my, as, as anybody else. But he, he, my, he father did, my, my father didn't want me to go to Vietnam, but he wanted me to find a good way to get out of it. And I said, Dad, I have a good way to get out of it. I'm telling them, no, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> no, no, don't do that. <laughs> Well, you know, in this book, Big Lies, you, you go through a kind of a history of uh, of deception and, and lies. And I think a lot of people today think that um, we live in a era that is um, the pinnacle of uh, fake news and so forth. I mean, obviously, that's that's not true. Um, and that's one of the reasons I did that book is, yeah. you know, lying is a long thing. And even even the lies that are going around now have been going around for a long time. I mean, God, they're still doing the protocols of the elders of Zion the, from, from the czar. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, lies just live on and on. And uh, well, uh, you say it's very easy. You, you say you, you say it's actually easy for to figure out most lies to identify most lies. If if it's so easy for people to identify most lies, why why don't people do it? I mean, is is it do people? Well, just, first of all, there's a big caveat. It's easy if you're a well-educated person. Mm -hmm. And this lying is often preying on poorly educated people. Uh, it's trying to play on young people and, you know, teachers have this job, you know, of teaching kids how to arm themselves against liars. Do you think we need to spend more time teaching people how to, how to think rather than what to think? um you know change it from we're going to teach you content to teach you process yeah i mean i've always i i, I have a daughter who is now 23 but as she was growing up and she would you know she she i think somebody soldered her cell phone to her hand it, it doesn't come out it's a permanent fixture there <laughs> and uh um you know she's always coming up with these statements and I always say, well, where are you getting that from? And she'll say, well, it's on the internet. I say, no, but I mean, what's the site? And who are these people? And why do you believe them? Oh, Dad. <laughs> yeah, it drives me nuts when I, I look on Facebook and I, and I see there are all these wonderful headlines, these incredible stories and pictures. And I'm like, this is fascinating. And then I can't figure out where it is or who said it. And, yeah. and I, I've pretty much given up, even though it could be such a wonderful source of information. Things kind of have a life of their own. Like uh, when was it the FBI came out with that report on Biden, and they they said that he he was a, an old man with a shaky memory. And then there was this thing that you saw all over the place saying uh, FBI says Biden has dementia. Mm -hmm. FBI didn't say that. Fox News said that. But as soon as the phrase got out there, it was just out there. Well, look, one of the issues that was raised in, in 1968, I think, was greater attention to the environment and you know, sort of rethinking our relationship to, to nature. And and you you talk about this a bit in the food industry, right? And how intensity of, of farming has led to depletion of a number of resources. You talk about this in the fishing industry and how the fish stocks have been completely uh, decimated and you know, and how intensive farming in the Midwest leads to algae blooms and so forth. Is, is Do we need to reprioritize our, our food uh, economy? I mean, is there is there a way that we can, we can rethink uh, how our, our relationship with, with well, food, does, does it require just more expensive food? Should we, do we need to just say, hey, listen, <laughs> it needs to be a higher percentage of your salary, or do we just need to reorient away from things like, say meat and dairy and more towards uh, things like, you know, legumes and. Well, you, you, you raise a really good question because 
Uh, I often think about this. I mean, the things that need to happen to food. And then I think, yeah, and then what are the poor people going to eat? Mm -hmm. You know, the way I think commercial fishing should go, um, fish aren't going to be cheap. They can't be cheap. Cheap fish is the enemy. Um, because if a fisherman, if you're going to tell a fisherman to catch less fish, he better get more money for it or he's going under. Mm -hmm. um, so does that mean that poor people can't eat fish anymore? I mean, th this is a real, this is a real question. It's a question about, you know, uh, improving agriculture, improving uh, uh, beef and dairy and everything, you know, that you do to improve it um, ends up making it more expensive. Yeah, I mean, if you think about China, for instance, I mean, meat consumption in China has increased dramatically over the last 30 years and, and poverty has decreased. But then you see these pictures of these 25 story, you know, pig skyscrapers and, and you think, oh, my gosh, like these these poor pigs. I mean, it's just it's just awful. Right. The way they they have to survive in these for very short periods of time. I, I, I don't have an answer for this. I've thought about it a lot. And all I can say is that we got to think about it a lot. When we're thinking about what's the right way to fish and the right way to farm and all of this, we have to keep asking, what are poor people going to be eating? Mm -hmm. uh, or how do we make food available to poor people? How do we make good food available to poor people? Because the way it is now, uh, I mean, I eat pretty well. You probably eat pretty well. Uh, poor people eat horribly. I mean, well, I also spend I spend an awful lot of food, a lot of money on food. Right? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, a absolutely. I mean, it, it's really striking. I, where I live, I have the grocery store around the corner, and then I have the the famous place down the street, mm -hmm. and it's roughly three times ex as expensive than the famous place. I love the famous place. The food is much better. Mm -hmm. Um. But a lot of people can't afford, well, in my neighborhood, they can actually, but. Uh, <clears throat> but you also don't have to eat a 24 ounce, you know, tomahawk steak for dinner. You know, you can probably have two, three ounces of that. that that's going to be good enough. Yeah. Well, you know, it's, you know, people talk about, you know, high intakes of salt and sugar. And. Why do they have a high intake of salt and sugar? Because they're eating this these bags of garbage. But you know, they're cheap and they fill you up. Um it's 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 really it's kind of a conspiracy. Not that anybody sat around and said, Oh, well, let's get the poor people. But they said, you know, what is the market for poor people? How how can we create really cheap, easy food that poor people will buy? And the answer is do bad things. Well, they could eat more onions <laughs> and more potatoes. <laughs> I, eat. I eat a lot of potatoes. That's my staple. But, you know, onions, uh, it's it's amazing how in, at some point in history, people would just eat an onion like, like an apple. And after I read the book on onions, I started trying to eat way. I mean, I already eat a ton of onions, but I started eating more. And, and I don't think you, you, you there was this famous... Um, the onion riots in, in India. Like yes. who would have thought that you would riot if the price of onions got too high? But there are parts of the world yeah. where- o Overthrown governments in India. But, you know, onions in India is a little bit like corn in the US. You know, there's this onion belt in the center of the country and it's a lot of people and a lot of incomes. And uh, if uh, onions aren't going well, you have uh, two or three states there where the people are going to be mm -hmm. really angry. Well, in America, I think the onions have gotten somewhat watered down i mean you you, you sing the praises of the the, the vidalias in, in the book but i i, I find that i I'm, I'm not that tolerant of these sweeter onions <laughs> like the ones that 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 uh that make you cry you know when you when you cut them up uh yeah but it, it's kind of for cooking mm -hmm. yeah uh i mean uh, uh, sweet onions caramelize better uh, if you make caramelized onions, my daughter is in love with caramelized onions. I put caramelized onions on everything. 
to do caramelized onions right is a lot of work. You have to keep stirring under a low heat for a lot of time. Um, and you can save yourself 20 minutes <laughs> by using sweet onions. There's one, one fun fact you didn't mention in, in the onion book, which is onions are the only commodity in the United States that the are prohibited by law from having a futures market. Really? I um, didn't know. That. Yeah, I there was some big, it, somebody it, tried to corner the onions market. And so the, the Congress actually wrote a law saying you can't have a future market in, in onions, which is totally bizarre. Written by politicians from either Texas or California. <laughs> right. Well, I guess one, one question, one last question I would have for you is, do you find that your experience of daily events like cooking and eating are affected by your, your knowledge of, of the history? I mean, I, I know my sister has like 20 different types of salt and she has the the Malden salt and she has the the Camargue salt and the, and the uh, Fleur de Sel from uh, from Portugal and the Spanish salt and so forth and the Himalayan salt and you know get the the diamond salt and the Morton salt well, and, well I do too because I collected them all when I was doing the book <laughs> never run out of them <laughs> right and and so you know I think you can sort of taste the differences. So, you know, blind tasting, you can sort of tell differences just in terms of the texture. But the and so interesting forth. thing about salt is it's not so much the taste. Uh, if it's pure salt is white. Yeah, it's a, it's the contaminants. It has, and the, it has and the, impurity. Uh, but one of the big differences is you get crystals of different sizes mm -hmm. and shapes, so they melt differently. And that makes a big difference in cooking. But I think also, like, if you know, I mean, this is true with wine, too. Like, if you know where the wine is from and you know the history and, you know, when you're sitting down to eat meat, if you know that the, the pig was, I don't think I could taste whether the pig was treated well or not. But if I know that the pig was treated well and I know the, the name of the farmer and I have another friend who, who raised pigs and his farm just went under, you know, very, very, you know, humane pork farm in California just went under because they couldn't afford the, the feed. I mean, if you if that knowledge of of the history of the origin of of the the ingredients, it, it has a subjective effect on your on your experience. It, it's psychological. I don't know. I, I have a friend who is a uh, sheep farmer in Idaho, and whenever I'm there, he makes me a dinner with his own lamb, and it is the best lamb in the world. Mm -hmm. I don't know if it's really the best lamb in the world, but it seems to me it is. <laughs> I mean, yeah. it's, uh, you know, this is my my friend raised this lamb and killed this lamb. And uh, well, I asked yeah. an artist. I asked an art historian recently. I said, "Well, you know, does your ability to does your knowledge of art enhance or detract from your aesthetic enjoyment of the art?" Good and question. He, and he said that it definitely enhanced, right? But you could imagine a world where you you become so detached from the subjective experience with your intellectualizing that you, you don't enjoy it as much. Do, do you, has your, how would you evaluate yeah, your- Jackson Pollock once said, nobody looks at a flower bed and says, what is the meaning of this? Because huh. <laughs> he was saying, you know, you don't think about it, you just look at it. Um, I'm not sure I agree because, um, I mean, it's interesting to know why Jackson Pollock was doing what he was doing. Yeah. Well, Mark, I hope we'll look forward to the next book. I know there's going to be one coming out awfully quickly. Uh, is the nonviolence book the, the next book that you have scheduled for release? I believe it is. Yeah. Yeah. It's by Godine, which is a Boston publisher, a very nice publisher. And, uh, and then I have a book. Uh, I also have a book I'm working on on lobsters. Oh, okay. I have a whole personal history with lobsters because I grew up in New England and I worked on lobster boats as a teenager. And, uh, you know, when you work with lobsters, lobsters are a very strange, barbaric animal. And, uh, um, well, I remember that uh, in, in early New England, there was, a, I think in the, the Massachusetts Bay Colony, there was a law that prohibited you from feeding your indentured servants lobster more than one twice a day right that's how cheap they were someday i'm going to write a book on the great myths of food and that's one of them uh -huh. oh okay i thought that was true I've never been able to find a record of that law 
Oh, all right. But I guess the it's message like, is that it's, it's like Mark. It's 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 like Marco Polo introducing pasta to Italy, uh -huh. uh, or uh, uh, Catherine bringing artichokes to France. So you know, there's there's so many of these food myths, and uh, um, it's great that they're starting that you know the academy is starting to have serious food historians go to uh, you know some food historians looked into this one about the lobster and nobody could find any record of any such law well you just disillusioned me i guess i can't include that in my class anymore <laughs> but, it is, but it is true that lobster was looked down on as a food uh, william bradford complained of his humiliation that somebody came over and all he could serve him was lobster yeah well it's true salt has become cheaper and lobster has become more expensive so Mark, thanks so much for joining me. I really appreciate it. I, I won't bother to go through the list of, of books. Uh, I'll just mention this most recent one. It's called The Core of an Onion. And so if you're like me and you love all the different uh, alia, right, including onions, uh, then you'll find this to be a treat. Lots of great recipes. And I'm going to be making some French onion soup tonight. And so great in your stories, great stories of the people who did the recipes. That's one of the things I love about giving recipes is you know, you do a whole history of feminism from cookbooks. Yeah, for sure. Um, and home economics is not something that's taught anymore. Uh, you you're can't right. take a, can't take a cooking class in college or even in high school. I took a cooking class in seventh grade. It was part of our education, and uh, I don't think you see that anymore. Yeah, I don't know. I, I took I had a choice, and I took industrial arts because I like to make things. But I don't know if they. You know, they taught you woodworking and metal. Oh, we working. had woodworking. We had sewing. I mean, I went to a, a fairly academic uh, high school, junior high school, which sent pe most of 100% of the students off to college. But we had shop and we had we had all that stuff. Um, I think that stuff's a thing of the past. Yeah, that's too bad. Yeah. Okay, well, thanks so much, Mark. We'll, we'll talk again soon. I look forward to the next book. Yeah, thanks, Harry. It was great talking to you. Unsiloed podcast is produced by University FM, elevating the stories of your institution.